let's see if we get lucky on this. Um, so I'm going to go to my device manager. I have a Pixel 4. That looks good. So let's just go ahead and try running this and see if we get lucky. taking a little while to run today. So here's our activity. So we see that we have the little one man band uh, and that one barred band. And let's see what happens when we hit play. Kaboom! Well, I hear the music playing. I don't know if you hear it, but um, let's see what just happened. Unable to start service with intent. Security, permission denial. Start foreground from process, blah, 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 blah. Requires Android permission, foreground service. Ta-da! So what we need to do is inside, and I forgot to copy that when I saw that. We need to go to our Android manifest. That's actually one of the more clear messages you'll get as far as an error in Android. A lot of times you won't have things that clear. So we're just going to put him up at the top here, saying uses permission foreground service. This is not a um, dangerous permission, so you don't need to get the user involved in, uh, in approving that. Let's try running it again. Okay, so there we go. I'm going to hit play. Can you hear that? It's actually playing the song. I'm just not sure if it's going to go over Zoom or not. It's kind of quiet, though. Can't hear it. Okay, I'm going to see if I can turn the volume up a little more. Can you hear that now? Ah, good, okay. So that should be on the recording, too. Um, now I'm going to hit stop, and it stops. But notice what happens up here on the toolbar, on, on the notification bar when I hit play. See the little icon shows up for the... Uh, uh, the notification. When I pull down the shade, I now see over here one barred band with the music player. This is that notification I created. I can hit this little drop down or use two fingers to swipe it and it expands it. If I had some expanded information, I could present it. If I pause it here, uh oh, that is not working. I'm not sure why that's not working. I must have done something a little silly. And if I tap on it, that still goes back to the application. Now, I'll see if I can fix the play button in a minute here. Um, but what I'm going to do now is get out of this application. So I'm going to hit back. And notice the music still keeps playing. It's going to have this foreground service going there. And I should be able to control it here. But those aren't actually working right now. Um, we'll just see what's going on with that. If I go back, if I click on this again, it reopens the application his state is not being tracked right. So there's something with the uh, the broadcast receivers I think is probably the problem. So I'm going to stop that. Whoosh. There we go. Okay, so um, let me take a real quick look. So at the music activity and the music service. There's some little subtle thing. I'm sure it's going to be in the, the music service because I uh, copied it piece by piece. So I'm actually just going to replace the entire music service here just to make sure that that's going to work. Should have been all the same code. And what is he unhappy about here? Oh, I had those in a different file definition. Yeah, let me copy him over. And is he happy now? 
I'm sure I missed just one line inside here when I was copying stuff over. Let's try it one more time. Oh, I never sent the notifications. Okay, so it's coming to here. Huh. That's really odd. I'm going to have to take a look at that example because this was working before. This has got to be some little subtle thing. There's just got to be some little subtle thing that I didn't do. So I'll, uh, I'll try a little bit later to... Uh, check the example and see if it works and then post the working one. So, but you get the idea here on how it's actually using that service to do the, to actually keep running the music, even when I got out of the application. And that's nice because, you know, I could go over and, you know, open up a Sudoku game and have my own music playing behind the scenes. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. Let's go ahead and uh, take a 10 minute break at 6 o'clock right now. Let's start back up at 610. Camtasia recording. So I found the problem. Uh, the, the issue was, let's see, I make sure that that sound looks good. Yeah, that's good. Um, so the issue was that the, uh, the prep example that I had uh, was using a different package name. So I was using Dude service as the application ID. And when I did this example as you know live here, I said Dude services. And so the set package was doing its job. It was making sure that these notifications weren't being sent. So when you clicked inside the notif notification or the broadcast, when you click inside the action on the notification, it wasn't doing the broadcast to any application other than Dude service, which didn't exist. So by changing this to services and then running it. I'll play the music and let's go to the notification. And now when I hit pause, boom, when I play, it, er, it resumes. When I hit stop, notice that the notification went away because the service has been killed. It was told to stop itself. Um, there is a little bug in here that it's not getting the state correct to start with. That's because we're coming out, coming back in. Um, if I had that state, I'd have to actually deliver that state from the service back to the, uh, the activity when I restart it. I'd have to pass that as an extra so that he'll know what to present there on the screen. Um, a view model wouldn't be sufficient for that because the activity could have been destroyed while the service is still running. Um, so ideally what we'd want is both a view model to keep track of the state so that if we rotate, it's going to keep the, the play button correct. And when you uh, tap on that to go back to the application, um, have it uh, pass the the, the current state from the service as well. Okay, so any questions? Onward we go. So that's a that's a simple started service, uh, and it's it's you know a decent example of why you might want to use a started service. Let's take a look at a bound service, and how that might work. So we're going to do this little person example. It's going to be a little contrived. It's basically going to have a counter that runs and updates people's ages uh, automatically, which is you know not super pleasant, but hey, it does. Um, so we're going to create a new service here. I'm just going to be real generic on the name here. I'm going to call it Remote Service Impl. And he is going to be a class. And he is going to be service like that and this time when we implement bind we're actually going to return something the thing that we can return is either going to be just a local object that we create here or we can use AIDL so if I wanted to I could do something kind of like this and I'm just going to type this up and then throw it away but just to show you how a local one might work if you assume everything's running in the same process um, we might have something like a private 
binder equals object colon. Actually, let's do a, um, I should be able to do this. Um, no, actually, I want an interface for that. That might actually help things a little bit here. Um, I'll just call it my binder. And he's going to have a fun reset, a fun add reporter. and remove reporter. I'm just going to leave that empty for the moment. And then inside here, I could have a private binder equals object colon my binder. And then we will implement the members. Kind of like that. Um, and then these functions can just directly change whatever state we want inside this class. Uh, so we could have add reporter just, you know, add a reporter to the list, remove reporter, remove reporter from the list, and so on. And then this guy would just be a matter of returning the binder. Was there anything in that that I needed? And what is he unhappy about there? Oh, there we go. There. So uh, this type of setup would let us use a local object. And then this local object just communicates with the remote service. So let's uh, put in a couple things here to keep track of reporters, for example. Let's say that we had a um, mutable list of reporters. Let's go ahead and copy that in there. And let me actually change the name of this guy. Then what this would do in here is just reporters dot add. That should actually be reporter. And reporters dot remove reporter. something kind of like that. So this is just basically a little inner object that's owned by the remote service impl that we're going to return. And when somebody talks about it, then uh, when somebody talks to it, it'll just directly interact with the service. And this only works if you're inside the same uh, process, if you know you're going to be in the same process. For this example, we're going to be in the same process, but I want to treat it as though we're in a separate process, just to show you how the AIDL works and all that. So what we're going to do is we're going to define this stuff here using AIDL. So it'll automatically be implemented. And then we're going to replace this with the thing that the AIDL gives us. Now to make this work, I'm going to come up here to this main and I'm going to add in a new folder called AIDL. And the Gradle plugin for Android knows how to build this automatically. So inside this AIDL, I'm going to create a new package com.javadude.services. And then inside there, I'm going to create some AIDL. I'm just going to go ahead and copy these files over and make sure that I update these. And one thing you'll notice about AIDL, in Java, if a class is in the same package, you don't have to import other things from the same package. So in this case, you'll see that remote service reporter needs person, and I'm explicitly importing it. Unfortunately, with AIDL, you have to be explicit on this. You have to say, even though it's in the same package, I'm importing that person. So let's take a look at the pieces that are in here. So person is telling us that there's going to be a, whoops, 
person class that's parcelable in the same package, com Java dude services. That's all he's doing is declaring that. Remote service reporter says that I can report passing in a list of people and an integer. And then the remote service itself has that reset, add, and remove. So these guys, when we do the build, are going to uh, provide us with an interface that we can use to do our job. So I go back to our remote service. He's going to want to use this guy as his binder interface. The remote service as his binder interface. So this guy is going to be remote service. And we'll notice that he isn't there yet. Let me go ahead and delete these guys. We're going to probably need to run a, a initial build on this guy just to get the AIDL to build. This is one of the things with um, with gen with code generation in Android Studio. There's certain times when it's it's a little flaky, where you have to kind of do this initial kind of bootstrap build. Um, it can be awkward. Or if you modify those AIDL, you have to to do that initial bootstrap build. Now, this is obviously going to fail because you know it's not working yet. But now I should be able to say, boom, there he is, remote service. And I'm going to say he implements remote service.stub. Well, he extends actually. So remote service.stub is a, um, what is he unhappy about here? Let me just get rid of all these guys here. Uh, remote service.stub is actually a binder. So you'll see that now this guy's not unhappy. Let me go ahead and implement our members. There we go. So those are the three there. <coughs> and we're going to keep track of this guy. Already got him up there. That's good. And then make it so these are non-null. And now we can say reporters.add reporter and remove reporter. There we go. And then reset is going to do something else we're going to mess with in a minute there. So this stub knows how to do the marshalling and unmarshalling for us. And this is all we need to do here. Everything else is, is, is uh, nicely automated for us. Well, there's one other little thing we'll need to do a little, a little bit later um, in, the, in the activity, but on the, on the uh, service side, this is it. So what we wanna do is we wanna set this up so that we're gonna have it count a certain number. So I'm gonna come up here I'm going to add in a var i equals 1. And whenever we call reset, we're just going to reset i equals 1. And then we're going to have a coroutine go that's going to actually uh, walk through those numbers. So in order for the coroutine, we need to go ahead and get a coroutine scope. So I'm going to create that. We're creating a coroutine scope here for IO dispatcher. This is just going to be used so we can kill a job if it already exists or know that a job already exists. And my binder is going to be just a little bit more complex. He's going to actually kick off a job if it's not already launched. So let me just copy that stuff over like that. And I need to define my person in a minute. Uh, but what I'm saying here is if I don't have a job, I'm going to create one by launching a coroutine. Then, Forever and ever, I'm just going to keep creating a list of people where the person is either Jenny or Tommy with that number added to their, their initial age. And then I'm going to say for each reporter that was in that list, call report. Pause it for a quarter of a second and then increment I. Now, one thing we have to be careful about here. Notice how we, we're using I here and here. And this will typically be called on the user interface thread when they actually make a request to, to uh, call a function. Whereas this is running on the IO dispatcher. So there are a ch is a chance that the I could be run non-atomically. You could, have, because basically what this operation does, the I++, is it fetches I, increments it, and then writes it back out to storage. So the plus plus itself is not an atomic operation. Um, we can set it up so that um, it makes sure that anytime we're doing these operations, uh, we take a look at it 
uh, as a, a complete whole. So we basically lock onto it by saying that I want to make this thing volatile. And this annotation just tells Kotlin to make sure that you treat all operations against this as volatile operation, or as, as um, a, a variable that uh, you fetch it, make the update, and write it all in one chunk. I believe that works. Or no, actually, maybe we have to do this an atomic integer. I think actually we have to do this an atomic. So I can say uh, val i equals atomic integer one and then i can say here i dot set one yeah yeah that's right i have to do this as, as opposed to the volatile the volatile is 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 needed to make sure that the the fetch versus the the right aren't overlapping um or actually, it's in case you have one thread updating something, the other one needs to see the current, current, most current value. That's when volatile is useful. But in this case, I need to say increment and set. Get an increment. I think that's it. Get an increment. Let me just double check. I haven't used this thing in a while. Atomically increments by one, the current value returns the previous value. Okay, good. So that's what we want. So he's just gonna do that plus plus atomically and it locks it so that if you have two threads hitting at the same time, you won't have a problem. Now we need to define this person. And person is going to be parcelable. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy the code that I had from the other one here. And I need to include the uh, Kotlin Parcelize plugin in my build. So I'm going to go to my build.gradle. And up there, just make sure I get the, the name of it right. Yeah, Kotlin Parcelize. Boom. We're going to add him in, resync our build. And now in my person, I have access to Parcelize. Now, I have this code commented out, which is the equivalent of what's going on behind the scenes. So what gets generated, just so you can kind of see that. Um, this is the only definition we need here. And because we defined person up here as parcelable, it's telling AIDL that he can parcelize it. So person is good there. Let's come back over here. That looks good. And now because this is atomic, I need to do a get on each of these. So what I'm going to want to do is before I'm creating that list of people, I'll say i value equals i dot get. So it's going to get the current value. And then I can just add i value to each of these. So what this is going to do is when I start binding to this, so when anybody binds to it, we're going to kick off this coroutine, spin forever, and then create a list, talk to reporters, create a list, talk to reporters, create a list, talk to reporters. Now, if there are no, if there aren't any reporters yet, it's gonna completely skip this report part. It's still gonna create this list, but it's gonna skip the report part. Um, okay, so that I believe is all we need inside this guy. Let me just double check what he's doing there. Oh, I wanna have an on destroy. And this is actually pretty important. Um, in this case, I'm saying if I have a job, cancel it, and then go ahead and just do the normal destruction. If you don't do this, that coroutine can keep spinning along until the whole process is killed by the system. So you want to make sure that if you kick off a, a coroutine inside of a service or an activity, that you're going to actually make sure it dies before you exit. So that all should be good there. So there's our remote implementation. And you'll notice that the only thing that's different here is really throwing that dot stub on the end here so that he's going to have his knowledge on how to do his uh, his parceling and things. Otherwise, it looks just like that first thing I was writing where it's just a uh, an object that you're talking to. So now in our activity, let's come back over to main activity. And I'm just going to paste that in there. And let's see. Services theme. There, I 
I think that cleans everything up. Yeah. So inside this guy, we're going to keep track of the binder that we're going to get back. So once we actually bind to the service, it's going to return a binder for us. We need to keep track of that so we can communicate with it to ask it questions. This is how we get a hold of that guy. This service connection is used when we bind as a callback. And so anytime we actually get a connection, it's going to pass us that binder and we keep track of it. Now we have to do a little bit of fancy uh, running around here saying, take a look at this stub that we have here and convert the binder, which is from a class I binder, into this actual type. And then what I'm going to do is as soon as I have that, I'm going to immediately add a reporter. Now you don't have to do this. You could have a button that adds a reporter if you wanted to. But in this case, this sets it up so that once we've bound, we add a reporter so we can start getting those callbacks right away. When we're disconnected, I'm just going to say blank out the binder so we don't accidentally try talking to it. And then the user interface on the screen here is going to have uh, two pieces of state. So there's going to be a little progress bar that's going to get highlighted. So we need progress state, which is going to be what value we have. That's that number coming back, one, two, three, four, and so on. And people state is just going to be the list of people that we're going to display on the screen. We're going to pass those both into this UE class down here. And let's see, here's the reporter that we're going to register. So the one up here, we say add reporter. This guy is a remote service reporter dot stub. So once again, that's stub, so he knows how to do his marshalling and things. We set up this report function to say, set my progress state to whatever that number was and set my people state equal to, I'll take that list join them to a string and the stuff I'm joining to a string is this little string here, the name colon age for each person. So that's just going to create a separated by new lines list of people that have their uh, name and age. When we start the activity, I'm going to try to bind the service. And when we stop, we're going to unbind. You want to try to balance on start and on stop or on resume and on, pa uh, on pause. Those ones are the, the opposites of each other there. Um, start and stop are a good one if you're doing binding. That's a good place to do that. So we're going to first of all say, this is the service I want to talk to, remote service simple, and I'm going to bind to it. And that passes in that service connection, which is the callbacks, this intent up here, and automatically create the service if it isn't actually running. On stop is going to say, if I have a binder, remove myself as a reporter, unbind from the service, which is the opposite of bind service, and then stop the application. So that's pretty simple so far. Now the user interface, nice little simple interface here with a list, the people string, the progress string, and what to do when the reset button is pressed. So up here we said when the reset button is pressed, I'm just going to say if I have a binder, call reset, which should set the number back to one. Okay, so here it's just a column where we have that button the progress indicator, and then the text. <clears throat> now we do need to add the service to the manifest. So let's come down here and instead of remote music service, it's going to be remote service simple. Again, we're not exporting. We're keeping in the same application. If we were doing this as two separate applications, and I'm going to be posting that after class, by the way, uh, just a version that has separate projects, you would want to export this so that the other application can bind to it. And I also need to add in an activity block for this guy. Well, I can just change this one from music activity to uh, main activity. Okay. And whichever one of these activities is listed first in here is the one that's going to run when you actually run it. I think we're good. Let's get to this try and see what happens. Oops. There we go. So this is connected to that service in the background, which is running this stuff. And every quarter second is returning back the value of i, and then this Jenny and Tommy objects, which we just put in the course of a string. If I hit reset, boom, 
it resets it again. So a really simple example here of communicating with a service uh, to use it as an API. So you can actually ask it questions, you can register callbacks, things like that. Any questions on that? Okay, and so I will post after the class uh, a, um, or at least point to in the old repository that I had. Um, well, no, this is, I, I had to do some modifications on this to make this to work. So I'll go ahead and post the uh, the two projects that actually have these things separated. So the, um, the service is actually being used from a different application. Okay, so that's it for that guy. Go ahead and close him. And let's see what was next here. So that was services. Oh, I want to talk about sensors. I think this is the right one here. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about sensors a little bit here. Um, every device has different set of sensors on it. And that's super, super important because you really can't make assumptions about what's going to be on it. It's generally safe to say that there's going to be an accelerometer on, on a device and usually a magnetometer. Um, but you really can't assume that. You really have to take a look at which sensors are available. And if it comes back saying, nope, there's no accelerometer, don't assume that. Um, there are some tablets out there that I've seen, and I don't know about recent tablets, but last time I saw this was, I don't know, six years ago. Um, there are some some tablets that didn't have an accelerometer in them. Uh, you know, these were mainly ones that were just meant for reading. And, uh, you know, because of that, you couldn't play games that allow you to tilt the machine. Um, each of these sensors are varying quality levels. Most of them are super, super dirt cheap because they're trying to keep their uh, their bill of materials down on this. And uh, because of that, there's going to be varying levels of what you can do with them. Um, so what you want to make sure is, you know, take a look at the ranges of values and adjust via the ranges of those. For the most part, you know, any type of tilting that you want to do is going to work pretty well. The magnetometer, on the other hand, tends to be one that really causes problems. I mean, I have a Pixel 6 right now, and... Uh, Every um, every phone I've had, other than I think the original Droid I had, um, ever since that Droid, the magnetometers have been really awful. And trying to get the the current direction that you're facing is is you know you, you're constantly having to recalibrate, and it doesn't calibrate well. Um, a lot of that is because they're they're cheap components, and magnetometers tend to have trouble when they're around electronics. So when you have a magnetometer inside of a phone, um, it's going to be noisy. You're going to be uh, getting some uh, interesting information coming off it. And combine that with, you know, any type of electromagnetic fields around you, it's it's going to be uh, problematic. Um, so uh, a magnetometer, by the way, is essentially a compass. <laughs> Okay. So there's several common types of, of these. Accelerometer, which gives you linear acceleration. You can usually use that to, to do tilt detection and things like that. Magnetometer is a three-dimensional uh, um, uh, compass. Gyroscope gives you angular momentum. And uh, there's more devices that don't have the, the gyroscope than magnetometer, um, but most do have a gyroscope inside of them. Um, a proximity detector is usually a light sensor that'll tell when your hand is getting close to the phone. And uh, that'll be used to like, you know, turn the phone on or turn the screen on, that type of thing. Um, sometimes proximity sensors are, are implemented differently, uh, but quite often it's just a light sensor. Temperature sensors can be ambient temperature or the, de the device temperature. Um, again, this is another one that because being inside a phone, it can be a little noisy because, you know, ambient temperature near a phone that might be running hot, you're going to pick up some of that in there. It's, it's not going to be super accurate. Um, and then air pressure. There, there aren't too many that have air pressure on there, but some do. They're barometric pressure. Now, the accelerometer, the easiest way to think of this is if you think of hanging scales. And I'm just going to, for this example, talk about two-dimensional acceleration. So if we thought about having four of these sensors, and there's actually six because it's three-dimensional, but if you have four for two dimensions, and think of it as like having a little hanging weight, um, in this orientation, the only one that's going to be getting any type of, of uh, pull on it 
is this top guy here because everybody else happens to be exactly at 90 degree angles or, you know, 180 degrees. Um, negative 9.8 is the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second. And the negative is saying because it's pulling down instead of pulling up on it. As you rotate the device, the vector of the accel of the acceleration gets split between you know one or more uh, ex ex these accelerometers. Um, so this can actually help you to decide what way your your device is actually angled. Uh, there's several uh, uh, ways of, of putting together uh, the, the accelerometer and the gyroscope and the magnetometer to be able to determine device orientation. Accelerometer by itself is generally not good enough for that, but it can be good enough if you just want to have tilt sensing for maybe making a ball go around on the screen. Uh, magnetometer is three-dimensional, and that's because of which way you're holding it. You can hold it flat, you can hold it up, things like that. Um, again, noisy because there's electronics around you. Using these different uh, sensors together creates a, a, a concept called sensor fusion. And there's a fantastic video. I should actually check if that video is still there. But it's called Sensor Fusion on Android Devices, a Revolution in Motion Processing. And it's fairly old. It's by a guy named David Sachs of InventSense, and a lot of the InventSense algorithms are actually incorporated into algorithm into Android as virtual sensors now. So there's a virtual orientation sensor you can use rather than having to do these algorithms. But his talk is fascinating. It, it really talks about how you can use different sensors to refine and get a really, really good idea of how the device is oriented. So well worth watching, assuming it's still around. <clears throat> the virtual sensors on the device use these different sensor fusion algorithms. So you might have a sensor that just pulls gravity. And this is important, you know, gravity versus linear acceleration. If you're moving the device, you're going to have linear acceleration in whatever direction you're moving. Um, gravity is linear acceleration always pulling down on it. And so being able to separate those out so you know which linear acceleration is happening due to gravity versus something else is super important. Um, and then the rotation vector is useful so you can to figure out which way your, your phone is oriented. Um, that can be uh, very useful for displaying photos and having them be the right position and things like that. Okay, so let's take a real quick look at an example here. I'm just going to go ahead and pull the example over. Oh, where did I put it? I didn't open that, did I? Oh, there it is. I just had it minimized. That was the problem. So this is a super, super simple little, uh, just as you move the phone, you'll see a, a puck move around on the screen. So what I'm going to do is plug my phone in, because this doesn't work terribly well on an emulator. So if you forgive me a second here, I'm going to disconnect from the internet on this guy just in case I get any uh, notifications from work. Generally don't like to show those. Um, okay, so that's good there. And let's see, I'm gonna get the... I need to mirror my screen here. And I think it's under here. Uh, whoops, I have an emulator running. Let me just go ahead and close that down. Do I have multiple emulators running? Yeah, it says I have another emulator running still. There we go. It just took a moment to, to die. Okay, so here's my phone. <coughs> and uh, let me go ahead and run this on here. And then I'll talk through the code so you can understand what's going on. But I just kind of want to show what it is. This is just uh, as you tilt the phone, we're gonna have a little ball kind of run around or a little puck kind of bounce around on the screen. And it comes off okay. I'm just using the accelerometer here. 
so it's it's not going to be a, a, a fantastic physics simulation, but for you know a real simple game, this could be perfectly fine. Um, and he's installing and installing and taking forever. That's weird. Let me try unplugging it. Do I have this? I do have it. Um, let me make sure I uninstall it and let it reinstall. Okay, so debugging connected. That looks good. Bring back up my thing there. And there we go. Okay, so my phone's laying fairly flat on the desk right now. If I pick it up, I'm going to pick it up and like look at it normally. The ball's down at the end of the screen. I'm now going to tilt the phone down. And we'll see the ball kind of go down to the bottom there. And then over in the corner. And we'll see how it kind of has a little bit of a bounce off of there. I mean, it's not real physics. But it's, you know, as I used to say, you know, close enough for government work. Um and we can also see it's showing us the uh, rotation vector on the screen. If I turn this way, you'll see that rotation three. Uh, if I turn the other way, rotation one. And if I turn it completely upside down. Let's see. Let's see if I can turn it all the way upside down. I must have it set so it doesn't allow it to go upside down. Uh, so the, the different rotation in the front there is giving you an idea of the device orientation. So rotation three is like this. I have it turned to the right. If I turn it to the left instead, it's going to switch over to rotation one. And that's important so that we can readjust what it means for the X and the Y values. So we take a look here with the X value. It says it's five. If I flip over, it'll say it'll say it's positive five and such like that because I've reorganized what the X and the Y coordinates look like. I'm going to turn it back vertical. When we're looking at the device, normally when you're holding the device, the default orientation has the y-axis straight up, the x-axis horizontal, and the z-axis coming out towards you. Uh, depends on Depending on the device, you know, certain devices it's more natural to hold in certain forms. A tablet might be more natural to hold, hold in landscape, in which case y would be going up the middle. Uh, based on your rotation, and you can adjust the X and Y so that it doesn't matter to your program which way things are actually going. So let me hop out of there. And let's take a look at the code in this guy. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm creating a piece of state here representing that puck on the screen. I'm going to give it a color. I'm going to give it a center location, a radius for how big it is a delta x, so this is its speed, so how, how fast it's actually moving, and then an acceleration on it, which is going to factor into the delta x here. Uh, the acceleration is directly driven by tilting the phone. Everything else, is, or the, uh, the speed is calculated after that. And, you know, again, this is way not perfect physics, so if anybody listening to this is a physics person, feel free to laugh. This is great. Um, it's a okay, reasonable-ish simulation for your average user type situation. Uh, if you want more realistic physics, there's some engines out there that can really do a great job for you. Uh, so what we're going to do inside here is I'm going to have to get a hold of a sensor manager so I can subscribe for updates on when things change. <clears throat> That's another service on the system, just like we were talking services before. I'm going to find the gravity sensor by saying, give me the default sensor for type gravity. That might be null. Um, I think in this case, I'm not actually testing for that. I'm probably assuming, which is not a great thing. Then for my little UE here, I'm going to say, you know, here's my sensors theme. That's just the, the colors and things like that. But I'm adding in this with local density current. And what that lets me do is it lets me translate between density independent pixels and actual pixels on the screen by using the density of the device itself. 
So he'll take care of that. And that's going to be this 2px function here. So inside of here, I have a piece of text that I'm going to remember. So I can actually put that text at the top of the screen and it's going to change it. It's a var because it's going to change. Here's that text. And then I'm going to set up something called a little box with constraints. This gives you the max width and the max height available to you in DP. Uh, sometimes you need it. In this case, I'm going to use that so that I can have a canvas that's going to draw this guy on the screen and know the, the bounds there. So I'm going to convert those into PX so that I can, I'm going to go from pixels, which I have to PX, so that I can pass those in. Uh, where am I passing those? Width and height. Oh, I figure out the radius. So I'm trying to, to do the radius in PX because he needs that in, in PX for the way I've defined puck info. I'm going to remember a puck info. And then what I want to do inside here is an initial effect. This is a side effect that runs inside uh, Compose, and it's managed by Compose. And there's two pieces that happen. The first time that your uh, function gets called to Compose things, it's going to run everything in here except for the onDispose block. Then when we want to get rid of this, so if you're exiting the application, it's going to run the onDispose to clean things up. So we're using this to basically hook up to the sensor listener and get feedback on what the values are from the accelerometer. Note that I'm passing in a key here. If the key value changes, it'll rerun, it, it'll first of all run the dispose for the current one if one's been running, and then restart. Now in this case I'm saying key one equals unit. Unit never changes, so therefore this function will only run once, and then dispose will run when we get rid of it. So what are we doing inside here? I'm taking a look at that rotation. That was that number, the uh, the one and the three and the zero. And based on that, I'm going to take a look at these rotations, and I'm going to set up a pair uh, of um, values here. To, or I'm, I'm going to convert the values. So I'm going to say, you know, take the first value and negate it second value as is if I'm in rotation zero. This one I'm going to take the second value, swapping it around, and then the first value. The next one I'm going to take the first value and negate the second. So it's like these are if you're in normal orientation and upside down, this is going to be rotated 90 or the opposite of that. So we're just adjusting these values based on the rotation of the device. And then I'm just going to put that text up at the top of the screen and modify the puck info. The last thing this is going to do is register our sensor listener so we can actually get that information. And did I have that listener up here? No, it's down a little farther, I guess. Um, where's the listener defined? Oh, he's this guy, duh. The one that I was just setting up. Um, so we set up the listener to, to adapt based on the current device rotation. Um, and then when we dispose, we're getting rid of that listener. This launched effect, again, it's another unit one, so it's only going to run once, runs at the very beginning. And I'm using this to just run a coroutine. So he runs a coroutine, and I'm just going to use this coroutine forever and ever and ever that just says delay for 50 milliseconds and then update the puck's location. When the puck's location is updated, that is going to trigger this puck here to be redrawn. So let's take a look at the puck function here. Well, let's look at the puck uh, move here. Puck move is just doing some really brain dead calculations here. So I'm going to say my new speed, just add the acceleration in each direction. Um, my new center, add the speed to the spot. So again, not super physics-y, but super, super rough estimate. And then these guys right here are just saying, if I'm going off the screen, bounce back the opposite direction. So here I'm saying, you know, if the new center is off the screen, so not in radius minus width minus radius, then I'm going to negate it, but I'm also going to divide it by two. So it gives, it basically slows it down. You hit the edge, you bounce back with only half the force in this case. Um, for some value of friction, that's probably reasonable. Um, and then I'm just going to make sure that the center stays between radius and width minus radius. So, uh, this will check the, uh, let's see, this is the, 
yeah, this is for the this is for the width and this is for the height. And then I'm just going to return a copy of myself changing the speed and the center. Boom, that's it. Okay, so this composable here is what draws it on the screen. We have the puck info modifier. We're just going to put a canvas on the screen and then draw a circle. We're drawing it at the center location with this color and with this radius. Boom. So real simple little example. We're just listening to the accelerometer. Well, in this case, the gravity sensor is what it's called. Um, and making this thing move around the screen. So pretty simple little thing. Any questions on that? That's really all I wanted to talk about for sensors. Bunch of other things you can do. I used I used to have uh, uh, students do an example with uh, sensors. The problem is it really requires a phone. And so when I was first teaching the class, I had a bunch of, of uh, you know of uh, you know cheapo phones that I got that I could hand out if people needed them. Um, that was just too hard to manage. So uh, we just went with uh, you can use the emulator for everything now. Okay. <clears throat> so there's that guy. And we'll get him out of the way. And let's see. So there were two more things. One is how to, yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, it, the uh, some of the examples that I had him do, um, I gave him an option to do a, a little marble maze type thing. And uh, some people did a great job with that. Uh, the tricky thing is making sure that the ball doesn't just jump through walls. So you really had to to take a look if a wall was intersecting the, the line where the, the thing was moving. Um, the other option that I gave them was a meteor game where you could turn the phone and you'd see meteors flying at you. And if you tap the screen, it destroys the meteor C. And then it would have little icons on the side to say if meteors were to your left or your right. And so you're basically kind of spinning around with like an augmented reality app. Um, and I had a real simple augmented reality example. Um, okay. So uh, last two things here, I want to talk about publishing and uh, uh, further resources. Now, publishing is one of these things that it takes quite a while to set up so that I have a clean slate to actually put something new up there, and go through all the stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give a link to the publishing module. Um, that way it's just the, the consistent example. That'll work really well. And we'll talk about resources. Whoops. So um, some other resources you can use here. You've probably already used developer.android.com. Lots of training stuff, news stuff, blogs, API guides, and sample code. This is going to be something that I personally am going to be contributing to very soon, which is really awesome. I'm just so excited about this. Um, I'm working on some samples internally and doing some internal stuff right now, but eventually it's going to be, uh, you know, it'll be much more uh, developer facing. Um, so developer and Android com, a lot of great stuff there. There's a bunch of tech blogs. There's a couple that I follow at the top here, Android Central and Droid Life. I can't remember if I follow Droid Life or, or anymore or not. I, I have a bunch of them in Feedly. And uh, the top two there are really for using Android. So if you're a user, you know, it's a bunch of announcements about stuff coming up and what people think about things. Uh, and I like to follow those. It kind of gives an idea of, you know, and there's a bunch of others I follow, but these are kind of the two main ones. Um, but it kind of gives you an idea of, uh, you know, how people are perceiving a lot of these things. Then for programming, there's some down here at the bottom. AndroidDevelopers.blogspot.com is the Android uh, Developer Relations team at Google. Uh, that's where we're going to post blogs and things like that. The Android Developers YouTube is where we post our videos. Um, so a lot of good stuff there as well, um, especially if you take a look at what we call a MAD application development. It stands for Modern, a Modern Android Development is what MAD stands for. Um, then there's a couple other links I have put in here, which have a list of blogs with information that seem pretty reasonable. Um, those would be pretty interesting to take a look at and see uh, what uh, you know what floats your boat. There's some really good tutorials from Lars Vogel and uh, M.K. Young. Uh, these ones, you know, sometimes they don't go super deep, but they can be really useful for getting the concept out. Um, and it's 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 a good complement for the stuff at developers.android.com. Um, Toots Plus also has a, a bunch of like walkthroughs uh, for building different types of application. Sometimes it goes a little deeper. Okay, and then for general assistance, there's always Stack Overflow. But remember, with Stack Overflow, keep in mind the uh, the copyright on that. 
Um, unless there's something explicitly stated that's um, a, say giving a license that you can use, don't copy and paste. Uh, Google, for example, when they put stuff on uh, Stack Overflow, puts in a comment up at the top that says that it's a, uh, a, a an Apache 2 license on any of the code that we post up there. So, um, you know, those are fair game. But if something doesn't list a license explicitly, um, you really don't want to copy paste it because that could cause you some legal issues. Okay. In the end, I want to say thanks, everybody, for attending. I hope you've enjoyed the course. Um, you know, there's uh, yeah, the live ones. Sometimes things go a little bit weird here and there, uh, but uh, it's it's always fun because uh, you know I get people you know responding to it, and uh, yeah, it it's it makes it a little bit different than just doing the online ones. Um, if you end up creating an app, let me know. Send me an email. Um, it I always love seeing stuff from students when they put apps out there, and then I get to try them. Um, and then you know also you know if you end up getting a job that uh, is you know you learn some stuff from this and it helped you get the job. Hey, I love to hear that too. It's, it's great when people can go out there and uh, apply this somewhere. You know, it's one thing to take a course just to get the check mark on your, on your uh, grade report uh, or your transcript. It's another to actually apply the stuff. And I really love it when people apply it. Um, if you have any feedback for me, you know, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you wish we would have done, what you wish we hadn't done, um, please, uh, you know, post those in the, the feedback forums um, you know, or send me an email. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I love to get that feedback so I can, you know, keep modifying the course over time. I'm going to be doing some mods this fall. Um, and I'm you know thrilled to get any suggestions that anybody might have. So that is that. Does anyone have any questions, comments, anything? Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, if, you know, if there's any questions or anything, you know, feel free to give me a yell. Um, other than that, uh, any, is anybody graduating? I don't remember if I saw any graduations coming up. You are. Well, congratulations. I hope that uh, you found the, the program useful. And, uh, you know, I know sometimes there's some courses which are, you know, not so great. But uh, hopefully most of the ones that, that you've taken have actually been really worth your while. Uh, and uh, for those who aren't graduating, you know, good luck with the rest of the course. And uh, you know, if you're not graduating and want to take the Kotlin course that I'm taking, that I, that I teach, you know, feel free. I do that in the spring. Uh, other than that, take care, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Good night.